Yeah, so my name is Angela Mensa, and um, this is a project that I'm doing with uh, uh, my advisor, uh, Professor Edward Barbier from Colorado State University. So, we all know that human capital is very essential to economic growth. Adam Smith was the first to lay this, the foundation for this idea in his, uh, uh, world, uh, in his address in 1976 when he said that acquired and useful skills of individuals are fundamental to wealth creation and economic growth. The fact is that this, the idea of human capital was not credited to Adam Smith, but by this statement he laid the foundation. And then we have other people like Roma who argues that for us, for poorer countries to, to grow, they have to accumulate human capital faster than the richer countries, faster than the initial level they have in order to grow. And Mark, you also acknowledge that poorer countries have to accumulate human capital faster. So basically, Macchio and Roma were following up on the steps of uh, Adam Smith and, and setting up the, the framework why human capital is very important to economic growth in general. So the, the research question starts from here when we ask that what happens if human capital is constrained by the environment? The premise is we need human capital to grow as a country or a, as a world economy. The World Bank estimates that more than half of the world's population is exposed to un unsafely managed water, and mainly those are from developing countries, and about eight, 800,000 deaths accrue to this type of pollution every year. Overall, about 24% of global debt can be linked to environmental factors in one way or the other, from air pollution, uh, unclean water, and, and all of that. So, the research question is, as if we have established that human capital is essential for growth and human capital is actually being inhibited by the environment, then how would that affect growth in general and what can we say about inequality? So basically, this paper we focus on the hours lost due to environmental mobility and, and mortality resulting from issues from the environment, from pollution, water pollution, air pollution, sanitation, anthropogenic climate change, and ecosystem degradations. So, we, so I want to say this on, on, on notice that we are focusing on the hours lost. So let me explain that. For example, if you spend two hours in a hospital because you ate contaminated food, the data account for all those. We are not looking at the actual body count. We are looking at the hours you lose as a result of mobility related things from the environment. And in this paper, we call that environmentally related impact on health. But in general, it's actually called the environmentally related disability adjusted life, life years or dailies. So basically, this is the framework of, of dailies, environmentally related dailies on the global scale. You see that low and lower middle income countries have higher proportion of environmentally related dailies. The higher income countries are, are, are basically, they, their percentage is quite low. When, when we look at it, even we, when we look at it in terms of per capita, they are way, way low, very negligible. So we can conclude from this that the effect is disproportionately high in lower and, and, and lo, uh, low income countries. So that would have influence for our estimation and what we should see. So the question is what is the mechanism by which this affects, we've established that it affects economic growth. So what is the mechanism by which it will affect inequality? So basically, this environmentally related health impacts is in two sessions. Deaths resulting from the environmental health risks or hours lost. Basically, that is going to affect the quantity and the quality of human capital that is available for production. So basically, if you spend two hours in the hospital, that is two hours less of wage you could have accumulated. So your income is affected. So based on that, we can say that the income distribution of the country will be affected. So the income distribution will be affected as a result of hours lost due to the environment. So if we establish that the income distribution is affected, the variance of the income distribution is what we generally call inequality. So basically, there is that link that once the distribution is affected, then the variance of the income distribution is affected. Now the question is, what can we say with regard to inequality? If, if inequality is affected by this mechanism, can we say something with regard to inequality convergence? So basically, that is what this research tried to address. 
So the question is, what is inequality convergence? The basic tenants is, comes from income inequality. Uh, income convergence, basically. Income convergence just say that poorer countries will have to grow faster than richer countries in order to converge to a common uh, income or a common group income. All things being equal, economists like that word a lot because it simplifies most of our problems. All things being equal, if income is converging, then inequality should converge at the same time. Let's look at that in simple terms. Let's say you're starting from $1,000 and you are trying to convert to $5,000. When you increase your income, basically you are increasing, you are reducing the amount of inequality you have if you are trying to move towards 5,000. So all things being equal, if we achieve income inequality, income convergence, then we should achieve uh, inequality convergence as well. So the two are sort of, uh, the inequality convergence is sort of like a side business to in income convergence. So we came up with these two strong hypotheses that having established that the environmental health risk actually affect income distribution and the variance of the income distribution, then we can clearly say that countries that are starting with higher level of environmental health impacts should experience lower growth in income. And if that is the case, then they will experience lower than a proportionate reduction in inequality. And also, it, we can also hypothesize that the growth reducing impact, like if a country is growing, we expect inequality to reduce as a result. But because of the environmental health risks, that, that reduction that should be coming from income may not, uh, may not be experienced. So basically, we will not be able to take advantage of the backwardness, or the backwardness may not even exist as a result of the environmental related health risks. So these are the specific research questions. Does the effect of the environmental health risks on human capital, which is coming from the income distribution, affect the speed of inequality convergence? Does uh, environmental health risks directly affect inequality reduction? Or does it also impart the inequality reducing effect that is coming from income growth? So we use data from the wider uh, companion database and the global burden of disease database. So that leads us to these three empirical estimations. First, equation one, we try to find out, is there inequality convergence? Can we say that the, the literature, Revalian has done a lot of work trying to prove that there is some level of within uh, group convergence in, in inequality. So can we say that there is inequality convergence? So we try to test that and, uh, and see if our results agree with what the mainstream literature is saying. And then if we can confirm that is, there is inequality convergence, then we can move a step further to find out the effect of the environment, which is on human capital. So the, the variable sigma would, would capture the effect of environmental health risk. And then we also incorporate the income effect. That's, that the effect of the environmental related impact on health impacts our convergence process. So these are the three levels of estimations that we will look at. So the dependent variables, the gamma G, that is basically the annualized growth in inequality, and then the annualized growth in income, which is the gamma mu. And then we estimate this uh, basic uh, equations. And these are our results. So basically the first, the first line here tells us that there is convergence. Because if you see here, the hypothesis we've put forward suggests that if there is income convergence, lambda 1 should be less than 0. That is basically what the convergence idea means. And we already stipulated that environmental related impact on health would worsen the rate of inequality reduction. So we expect a positive, a positive result from there. So lambda 2 should be positive. And basically, that is what we find. So when we, we estimate the three stages of equations, you realize that when we incorporate the environmental health risk here, we get a, the plus thing here is actually the three dots. Basically, there was not so much space, so we just made the three. So that is the significance at the less than 5% uh, significant level. And so basically, the environmental health risks have a very significant effect on inequality reduction. And you realize that when we incorporate this, the speed of convergence, this is the speed of convergence, the speed of convergence increase across board. It is only when we disaggregate it into income levels that we see slight changes 
which we'll get to in the minute. So we try to also address the issue of endogeneity. Is it possible that initial um, incident of environmental related health risk and initial inequality are, are talking to each other somehow? So we address that using the instrumental variable. And the results, the coefficients have improved a, a lot, but then the signs are the same, meaning that um, we, are, we are on the same track as far as the two estimators are, are concerned. So now, the, the, the exciting part was when we decompose the whole data. This is the data for 176 countries. And when we decompose the data into income groups, we realized that the low income groups have a, a higher speed of convergence, which agrees with the literature that the, the backward, we take, they have to take advantage of the backwardness. Uh, uh, yeah, that was developed by, that, that statement was mentioned by Alexander who says that once you have initial, your initial inequality is higher, then you should grow faster. So the speed of convergence for lower income countries appears to be higher. But then when we look here, and higher income countries anyway, they have no need to be growing faster, to be reducing faster because they are originally starting from a low, a low place. So that makes sense for them to have a lower growth, a lower speed of convergence. And now let's look at what happens to income. Look at that. So in terms of income, we realize that between the high upper middle income and high income countries, income has no effect on whether they reduce inequality or not. And then between the low and lower middle income countries, we realize that growth in income is actually worsening their inequality reduction process. So as they grow, inequality is worsening. That is what we see in the data. So basically, that, that literally confirms some of our hypothesis. And, um, as unfortunate as that is, basically that is what we find. Now, so we use the predicted values from these estimations to try to find out Given this parameter estimate, how long would it take a particular country to converge to a group mean? So we, we decided to make the group mean to be the group mean for high income countries. So this here, that is the inequality when we look at all high income countries. That, that is the, 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 um, the mean for all high income countries. So we want to, we use a simple uh, compound, a reverse compound interest formula to and the predictive values from the earlier equations to find out that if you are growing or you are reducing your inequality at a certain rate, how long would it take for you to converge to this group mean of, of the average of high income countries? And we see some very interesting results. For example, look at Nigeria. They, they, in 91 years or 92 years, they should be converging to the, the space of people like Finland and Norway. But once we account for the effect of the environment, they have no chance at all. Oh, almost. <laughs> right? So, and, and if you look at the raw data, it's, it's, it's so surprising. And so one thing we can see from this graph is that countries that are reducing their environmental related impacts on health faster tend to grow faster or tend to reduce their inequality faster than their counterparts who don't. So basically that's, that is what we see throughout, throughout the data. And look, Benin also probably have no chance. And then Nicaragua, very, very interesting story. So we have a lot of countries that are doing well because they are reducing their level of environmentally related health risks faster than their counterparts. So that literally shows that they might be converging, all things being equal, when current levels of inequality reduction persist over time, they should be converging to this group mean in 93 years. And that's quite a good approximation. So this is a, a very conservative estimate. Things could change, right? Things could change. There could be political instabilities and stuff like that that could throw this result off. So that's why we're saying all things being equal. If they continue on the same trajectory, this is how long it will take. So now, I don't know how, why that moves so fast. Okay. So basically, these are our findings, right? Countries, we realize that Countries with higher initial incidence of environmental related impact on health, simultaneously they have worsened levels of inequality. But when they reduce uh, the level of environmental health impact faster, then they tend to converge much quicker to the group mean than, than their other counterparts. So basically that is telling us that if we ignore the effect of the environment, we will be underestimating the speed of convergence. And also we see that 
uh, inequality, high inequality coexist side by side with income growth in developing countries. And I think Revalian also found something similar in, in one of his uh, 2018 paper where he said that basically in developing countries we see that high inequality is existing side by side with high income growth. So we don't know why yet. We expect that as you are growing, your level of inequality should be reducing. But, but for developing countries, that's not the case. So basically, in, we can say that income growth per se is not sufficient to reduce inequality, at least in the, in the story of developing countries, be, because of the level of environmentally related health risks that is actually impeding the, the human capital accumulation, because they are not able to, to, already they are deficient in human capital. And the environment is also making the situation worse off. So they are not able to accumulate in our human capital to take advantage of technology that is developed elsewhere to grow. So basically, that is what we see. Now, what are some of the policy implications? The fact is that countries cannot expect to grow if they don't reduce the environmental uh, related impacts on health. That is one thing that the, the data shows us. So in the case of developing countries, basically, when when you look through the raw data, one thing I would say is that you see that there is some strong heterogeneity in the type of environmental related impacts that developing countries face. Developing countries face things like water pollution related issues, sanitation related, so people die due to sanitation related issues. But when you go to developed countries like the US and the rest, people die due to temperature variations and stuff like that. So basically it tells you that developing countries, their issue is just to fix the infrastructure build infrastructure, build toilets, build water, basically. And that can wipe out a number of people who are dying each year once you fix the infrastructure. So improve access to water. And also, many developing countries are still using firewood, charcoal, and those things. And that is uh, cause a lot of air-related air diseases, right? So what is the big picture? The big picture is that our findings actually reaffirm the need to aggressively target the Paris Agreement and, and try to achieve them. For example, let's look at this. If we, the green, the green energy transition, which is the SDG 7, by achieving that, we might actually eliminate the number of people who are dying as a result of energy-related sicknesses, like using charcoal and firewood. And once we achieve that, we basically improve inequality as a result. So the, the achieving the sustainable development goals actually is essential for us achieving the inequality. I know inequality is the SDG 10, but basically this is telling us that we have to achieve seven in order to achieve 10. And in terms of clean water, clean water that is SDG 6, we want to, if we can be able to build infrastructure, provide clean water and solve the sanitation problem in developing countries, we might actually eliminate over 800,000 deaths that accrue to these countries every year. So basically we are using one stone to kill two birds, basically. So this result actually affirms, so you realize that improving economic inequality, improving economic equality between countries and improving welfare is really strongly tied to our ability to achieve the sustainable development goals. So basically these are the findings from this experiment. Thank you.